morning. Welcome to To The Point. We're happy to have back with us Congressman Bill Heisinger. Congressman, uh, this is uh, not the first time you and I have talked in the last couple of weeks because yeah. it was just about two and a half weeks ago that you were over at the Van Andel Arena with President Trump. We're going to talk about that visit, but first I want to talk about something that happened. Each time this president has put his spending priorities forward, he has either zeroed out or nearly zeroed out money for the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative. And it's one of the ways that Republicans and Democrats in Michigan come together because they all are usually uh, unanimous in saying, no, 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 you can't do it. And not just, by the way, in Michigan, yeah. all around yeah. the Great Lakes. During that visit, the president bothered to say from the podium, speaking to you and a couple of your Michigan colleagues, that, hey, we're going to put that money back in there. Not that the president necessarily had the ability to take it out in the first place. Uh, hey, that money's going to go back in there. And he credited you and some of your colleagues. What's behind all of that? I mean, this yeah. is a, it's $300 million. It's a rounding error in the federal budget, right? But overall, but it's a priority, right? right? And, and look, I, we battled this uh, in the Obama administration. There had been a reduction proposed in the last couple of years uh, on a bipartisan basis. We, uh, we pushed back on that uh, when uh, when the president came in and uh, initially zeroed it out uh, we got back together and, uh, and and at the end of the day Rick we hope that he is listening to this and 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 the folks that work for him uh, are listening that this is a priority not just for Michigan but for as you as you point out rightly the entire Great Lakes and at the end of the day um, uh, we uh, we know that whether it's a proposed House budget or a proposed presidential budget, both of which are required by law, uh, but are traditionally ignored. Uh, those are but those are guideposts and guidelines, and it, it really is the House of Representatives that has the constitutional power of the purse to put that back in. But it's a lot easier now when we have the president publicly saying into a microphone from a stage. I'm on board with this. Uh, let's get it done, and uh, and it's uh, it's uh, that hopefully lowers the temperature on the issue at least politically. You make a good point, and when I say it's rounding error, I don't mean to diminish it, but it it seems odd to me as an observer yeah. that that 300 million out of trillions of dollars of spending uh, would be a target. But talk for just a minute about what that does. This is not unlike what they did in the Chesapeake uh, watershed and what they've been doing for decades there in the Everglades and yeah. elsewhere, protecting waters uh, that otherwise w could be contaminated and could create real problems for for big regions in the country. Well, and that's actually exactly the example I used with the president was Lake Okeechobee in the Everglades and what had uh, what had gone on. In fact, Al Steinman from Grand Valley State University, who was out in Muskegon, uh, had worked on that project and was brought up here to to work on Great Lakes issues. And and uh, you know the president asked about uh, the Asian carp situation. Uh, he asked about okay, what is this money really used for? And we talked about the cleanup. I tried to tie that. That in look as you know we're dealing with legacy issues from our manufacturing history and our base that Michigan has had a lot of those cleanup uh, 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 sites are along along the lake shore as we know because they used to just kind of dump stuff in uh, that uh, that was the common practice and uh, we've got to go back and we've got a responsibility to clean that up on top of the fact that we're international waters Michigan Lake Michigan is the only one that isn't international waters because the rest of the Great Lakes uh, are uh, obviously border Canada. So um, it, it, you could see him connect it and you could see him kind of understand. Um, I'm not sure he believed that he was going to get as big of an applause line as he as he was going to get. But we know that uh, the Great Lakes issues crosses, you know, socioeconomic boundaries, political boundaries, county lines, all those things. We all have an attachment uh, to uh, water here in Michigan, and it's very important that we protect it. Don't want to get too far in the weeds, but let's talk a little bit about the budget <clears throat> process. Yeah. Because uh, the president laid out some priorities and some spending that he would like to have. Uh, some of his... Or spending he doesn't want to do. Well, yeah, right? there's yeah. that as well. Um, and he uh, he has already made some changes, this, uh, some other money, Special Olympics that we heard the, the conversation around. Does any of it really matter in terms of the budget process? Because aren't 
you as a body and the government heading towards another continuing resolution rather than a real budget? Well, it's interesting, just this past week in Washington, uh, the Democrats knew that they weren't going to be able to pass a budget. We have done that uh, as the Republicans uh, usually in the eight years that I've been there, but we haven't always, but we usually have. And they're tough votes because uh, they're certainly in a, a, sometimes an attack point because you're laying out your priorities, you're looking at, as we were trying to do, balance those budgets over a number of years. And we remember those commercials of Paul Ryan before he was speaker, Paul Ryan uh, pushing the old lady over the cliff, for example. You know, I mean, all this, this heated rhetoric that surrounds it, uh, but what, it, what had happened this past week is the progressives, the, uh, the, uh, the Democrat socialist wing of the party had stopped the uh, Speaker Pelosi and stopped the Democrat uh, leadership from moving ahead with a vote on a two-year uh, budget uh, that really was uh, going to be spending caps. It wasn't, and again, not to get too far into the weeds, but it wasn't just a proposed budget. It was, what are those caps going to be? And they literally, what they want to do is spend the exact same dollar amount on uh, social services uh, as we do on the Defense Department. And uh, that they don't want percentages of, of equal increase and those kinds of things. Uh, the, uh, the, the Progressive Caucus called for exact same dollars being spent on both sides. Well, um, you know, that, that just isn't necessarily in touch with reality as, as I look at it because we have seen a, a, a massive decline in unemployment. We have seen wages going up. We have seen the economic success that the country has been going for. And we would hope that that would mean fewer people accessing uh, some of those social services programs. And uh, yet they're calling for increased spending there, and some are calling for decreased spending on, uh, on the defense side. And uh, the, the, at the end of the day, as you point out rightly, we're probably not going to be passing any individual appropriate appropriations bills. If we do, there'll be precious few. Uh, and it's going to be kicked over into some sort of continuing resolution or a, some sort of omnibus bill. But I, I think that, um, you know, Nancy Pelosi may be able to pass something through the House. But at, at, uh, at, as the way the system works, the Senate's going to have to be involved and the President's going to have to be involved. So it's going to have to be a very different budget and spending plan as they uh, maybe have in their heads uh, right today uh, what could be the final product. But it's not going to be pretty, I can tell you that. What, one, of the, um, one of the outcroppings of this is, is every administration, I think in my lifetime, that I can recall at least, has talked about the deficit and the growing deficit and we're going to do something about the deficit and each one of them has. Uh, practically each one, they've all made it bigger. Bigger. And, and that continues yeah. even now, right? I mean, the deficit continues to grow. And you sounded the alarm some years ago saying, hey, at some point, and we, one of the things we've been protected by a little bit are low interest rates. Yes, but, totally. Uh, but Artificially low interest rates had been. And, but. And, but one of the things that you talked about a number of years ago is there will come a time when the interest on the national debt will be one of the top spending line yes. items, and that still remains true, particularly as interest rates grow. Yeah, absolutely, and it's gonna be in this coming decade that uh, we will see interest on the debt surpass not only just social spending, but Defense Department spending. And uh, that is, uh, that to me is a, uh, is, is a, a massive trigger that uh, should be causing people to look at doing things like what I have proposed is adding a balanced budget to the U.S. Constitution. A, a balanced budget amendment would require us to live within, uh, within our means and not mortgage uh, our current spending on the future uh, you know, with our kids and our grandkids. And there's, there's certainly safety valves that you could put in place, but you know, this is not just a one-year budget solution. Uh, even Ron Paul, when he was in, uh, in the House, had proposed a budget that would take three years to balance. Uh, the, the last couple of years in the House, we were proposing five-year and seven-year uh, uh, years to balance. But it's not just a short-term spending. It's that medium term. What are those longer sort of infrastructure projects that take years to develop or Defense Department programs that take years to develop? But then we have the long-term spending, that legacy element. How do we make sure that we protect people like my mom, who is accessing Social Security and Medicare and those kinds of things now, and make sure that they're, they remain whole, yet we address things like um, life expectancy? Uh, we address things like uh, the, the benefits that people are seeing medically uh, and preserving that. 
And how do we make the system, that safety net system, truly a safety net for those that are needed and, uh, and, and make sure that Social Security and Medicare are in place for future generations? And we, we, we have to have the courage, Rick, to go in there, face that, and, and, do that, and deal with that and, and propose some changes. And there are a couple of problems there. One of the problems is you've got this big tsunami of baby boomers yeah. that are going to be accessing all of those. <laughs> they already started. But they will continue over the next uh, half a dozen years to start accessing all of those programs. It seems unlikely that there would be the political w will to limit their uh, access to those kind of things. But still, that's going to be a, a big pressure on the system. And there's still uncertainty about the overall health care system. We're not going to have time to finish yeah. that conversation uh, in this segment. But talk a little bit about those boomers coming in and, and what the health care debate should sound like because it's going to impact them as well as younger people too. Yeah, well, uh, we should have dealt with this. Uh, that's, that's a common mantra in uh, Washington, D.C. And, and other places as well. But we should have dealt with this earlier because small changes now have great changes further, uh, further out from uh, that point that you go. But nonetheless, we're, we're where we're at right now. What I don't think is the solution is taking uh, uh, private pay insurance, private insurance away from five and a half million Michiganders uh, and, and rolling it into this M Medicare system that frankly is geared for seniors that uh, mostly works, but we know there's still problems with that. And, uh, and, and to have sort of this uh, grand Medicare for all as Bernie Sanders coming into West Michigan talking about uh, that doing, it, it's not going to, uh, it's not going to be feasible. I mean, that's $32 trillion uh, for his proposed program over 10 years. That's, that's, that's almost as much what, as what we're spending currently in the federal budget all for a new program. So how, why we would walk away from uh, from employers and individuals being involved in their health care uh, uh, insurance, I don't understand. I want to continue this in just a moment. Well, we're we're going to take a break, and when we come back, we're going to talk uh, about Senator Sanders coming to West Michigan, to your district. That's next, To The Point. As we come back to To The Point, thank you, Congressman Bill Heinzinger, for being here. Let's talk about health care yeah. and Medicare for all. Let's talk about Senator Bernie Sanders. By the time this airs, he will have already been into Ottawa County uh, on a swing that he's making all through the Midwest, ending up, I think, over in uh, Pennsylvania on Monday for a town hall on one of the networks over there. This does a couple of things. First of all, this continues his conversation about Medicare for all. And, and you must know from your perspective that that has really caught the attention of a lot of people, particularly those folks who are very interested in this election cycle, mm -hmm. because they feel like the health care system with the modifications of the Affordable Care Act and the uncertainty, because this president and you as a Republican caucus have promised for years to repeal and replace, and there's an uncertainty that goes with it. When a Senator Sanders or somebody else says, we're going to scrap everything and we're going to go with Medicare for all, at first blush for some people, they've got to say, well, at least that's something, right? Well, that, that was the answer of why the ACA, or quote unquote, Obamacare came in. Well, at least it's something. Well, that something turned out to be worse. Uh, now, I would not count going back to the system that we had prior to the ACA as success. Um, there were some valuable things that uh, that were discussed and decided as a as a as a country. Pre-existing conditions being that leading issue and something that I've supported all along. You know, someone shouldn't be able to uh, be uh, be uh, disqualified from uh, getting a, a a plan simply because they have had autoimmune disease or cancer or something like that. But this notion that the federal government's going to come in and do it better than the private sector is just a farce. And you know, frankly, it's new people talking about very tired old ideas that have failed in the past. And so what, what we have to look at is how do we continue to get us as consumers, because we're both consumers, we're, we both have families. I, I know that uh, we, we've had to access uh, health care, uh, personally and individually, all of us and for our loved ones. But we've got to be very careful about just turning this over to the federal government because it has not done very well with it. Uh, you look at what's happened with the VA. Uh, the VA has come a, a ways in improving, but we're still far behind where we should be able to be. I just was meeting with somebody uh, this morning who was talking about mental health issues for veterans and, and the length of time it takes to access those mental health 
crucial, critical timing that is wasted and lost uh, simply because of uh, inefficiencies and mismanagement. And uh, so we have to be very, very careful when we're going to say, hey, we're going to adopt this, this, uh, this health care system that's just going to turn all the decision making over to the federal government because I, I think that leads to down a very bad path and, and one that ends up failing. Uh, quickly, and just for the sake of argument, I would point out that, yes, you and I both do have access to health care, but part of the problem is there are people who don't. They don't mm -hmm. have full-time jobs. Yep. Their business uh, or their their uh, employer doesn't offer it. And that creates uh, a pretty uneven playing field for folks out there. Uh, so it is it is understandable that people would want to look to the government for some type of relief, whatever that might be. I mean, is there a blended uh, type of, of program that you could ever agree with on Democrats well, to come well, there, together? There, there is a number of programs already. S-CHIP for, for children, for example. Uh, people that uh, that have low and moderate income are able to access it through Medicaid. When I was in the state legislature, one of the biggest line items was actually Medicaid. And that's that's both federal and state uh, spending that goes and into that. So today. Uh, you know, and, and interestingly enough, uh, Obamacare was supposed to take care of those uninsured. But we still have uninsured folks that uh, that don't have that access. And what they really don't have access to is preventative care, right? You know, anybody by law is able to go in and access an emergency room. What we, the problem is, is we see people accessing the emergency room as their primary care. And um, that, that really is what builds some expenses into it that, uh, that we need to, to pound out. What I would love to see happen, something along the lines of what they did in Muskegon County a number of years ago, and they call it the three share, where you have the county government, the employer, and the employee. Uh, all joining together and saying, "Okay, we're going to we're going to provide some basic health care, uh, and uh, and none of us are going to have to shoulder all of it because none of them could shoulder all of and burden all uh, uh, shoulder all of that burden." And it, it's those kinds of things where we have to have, as consumers of that, we have to have some sort of buy-in, I believe, for us to understand the value of what it means to to, to have that. So there's uh, there's a number of uh, of things that have been proposed. Um, I just think that Obamacare, the way it was implemented, uh, it, uh, it overpromised and underperformed. Uh, it did bring some folks who didn't have regular insurance into a, a regime where they had access to that insurance. But you also saw the cost, uh, whether it was premiums or deductibles, skyrocket uh, for lower and middle income families as well. And, and, and that actually, ironically, forced some people out of that health care system. This dovetails into that, uh, Senator Sanders, as I said, by the time this airs, will have already been in the area, will come into Ottawa County, yeah. uh, which is not always a place that Democratic presidential candidates go. I can think of... Well, uh, Hillary Clinton was here the day before the election. I, yeah. I remember it well, uh, and I remember the Reverend Al Sharpton was in Ottawa yeah. County a number of years ago. What does that tell you, A, about the argument about health care, because that's a big plank for Senator Sanders, and B, what does that tell you about the necessity for both... Democrats and Republicans to contend in Michigan given the recent visit from the president and now this visit from Senator Sanders. Well, we know that, let me start there, we know that Michigan is a battleground. Uh, you know, the president won it by just under 11,000 votes. Um, uh, by the way, I think we ought to look at not having it be a winner-take-all uh, for the Electoral College. I think it ought to be uh, what happens in Maine. You divide it up by congressional district. It would get people around the state rather than them just coming to Grand Rapids and, and Detroit. Um, but that's a that's a that's another that's story. Another show. That's another show. But uh, but it, it, the idea is to to make sure that your state is competitive and has the attention. Because frankly, if we didn't have that opportunity to have that ride in the car with the president on the way to Van Andel Arena, we wouldn't have been able to really dive into the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative, right? And we you know we, we have to tell our story. And 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 it's a good thing that Michigan is getting that kind of attention, where maybe the new Ohio, right? You know, it used to be Ohio was that bellwether, and maybe Michigan is that new bellwether. There's no doubt that Donald Trump has taken the political puzzle pieces of Michigan, shaken the box, threw them out on the table, and as I like to say, you, you know, you start with a puzzle, you try to find the corners. Well, we found the corner, but we don't know if it's the lower left corner or the upper right corner of that puzzle, uh, because you've got him overperforming in places like Macomb County and Western Wayne and Monroe County, and then politically underperforming in, in 
in places like Kent County, Ottawa County, that had been maybe more traditional Republican strongholds. So uh, I think it's good for Michigan to be able to tell their story on, on all sides, whether it's Bernie Sanders coming in or President Trump. Uh, but uh, it, it, the health, getting back to your first part of the question, health care has not gone away as an issue. You know, some people think it was somehow settled or it was, not go it was going to be ignored. There's no way. Uh, this is uh, because Obamacare was... Uh, frankly, uh, uh, less than what it had promised, and because it is unsettled even among the courts as to what uh, the uh, what provisions of it uh, can and do stand, uh, we we have to deal with uh, with health care. We I'm eager to he deal with health care, and we th have to think innovatively. It's difficult because if you were to start from scratch, you would never build the type of system that we have in the way it looks right now. Uh, but we we have to uh, continue to attempt to address uh, those challenges challenges that are in there and it's about accessibility greater accessibility at lower cost with higher quality and uh, and that needs to be our common goal all right I'm going to shift gears kind of a hard shift I want to talk about money for a little bit because from the financial services committee standpoint you've been doing work with banks one of the things you said a minute ago which I think is uh, interesting uh, to repeat we talked about low interest rates and you said artificially yep. low interest rates uh, and so for folks who are buying homes or doing some of those kind of things they don't mind if they're artificially low but if on the other hand uh, you have cash investments or you have money to lend then having those low could uh, be a stress and I assume that some of the bankers that you talk to some of the folks uh, in the financial services world world have a, a take on that that they express to you well I, I, go talk to uh, realtors and builders and people that are in uh, car dealers anybody that is that is dealing with interest rates right now and and they love it I, I get that. I understand that. My family is in construction, third generation. That we've been we've been doing that. Uh, I understand the why. the The problem is is if we have another economic downturn, the traditional uh, tools. Uh, that the Federal Reserve has used to uh, to spur along the economy, um, there's 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 no give there anymore because we've been maxing this out. A quantitative easing, which was this this artificially lowering of the interest rates uh, through the federal government buying bonds and then pretending like that was out on the open market, um, that has lowered those interest rates, but it has taken away that that ability for the fe for the Fed for the Federal Reserve to come in and say okay it's time to hit the gas pedal again a, a little bit and there's nothing left on the pedal we've been we've been using all of the energy that we have to continue to have this uh, uh, this uh, economy moving forward. Until recently, this past year, the Fed started to moderate or normalize some of those interest rates. And one of the uh, Fed uh, officers uh, uh, equated it to me uh, like this. He said, look, we're not hitting the gas anymore, but we're not hitting the brakes. We've just lifted our foot off of the gas. And uh, that, I think, is the proper thing for the Federal Reserve to do. But it takes in a much broader conversation about slowdown in China, what's going to be happening with Brexit, uh, the effects on the economy there, uh, world economy, certainly uh, affect us here in the U.S. I mean, we've been somewhat insulated uh, from uh, where the uh, rest of the world's economy has been going. When we've been growing at 3% plus uh, quarter by quarter. Uh, that is uh, that is far outpacing where the rest of the world is, and I want to stay there. Uh, I want to make sure we continue to do that, but we have to normalize some of those uh, interest rates. This is terribly unfair, but in 20 seconds or so, the president has taken unusual measures in declaring an emergency about the southern border. Yeah. We really are about out of time. Uh, is that something that's going to end up being fought all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court? I, I would suspect so, but here's here was my conclusion after looking at uh, what uh, the power, uh, constitutional power that Congress has given up over decades, not just to, to any president, but over decades. He has the legal right to do this. He is using monies that are designated within the Department of Defense for the vast majority of this and getting them reprogrammed. So he's not taking NASA money or transportation money. Uh, it, it is uh, money that's appropriately geared. I don't particularly like that process, but that's where we're at, and now it's time for Congress to change the process. Congressman, thank you as always for being our guest. I'm sorry we're out of time. I would like to spend more time on that. We're back at Final there. Word to the point. There is, of course, so much more to talk about, budgets and borders and so much more. Each Sunday morning, we'll try to keep you updated, and of course, what's going on here in Michigan? There's still no agreement on that gasoline sales tax, and there is still no budget agreement. There is time, of course, but 
time does seem to collapse in Lansing. We'll be watching that as well when you join us each and every Sunday morning here to the point.